Hey everyone, welcome back to another retro discussion video. Today we're going to be going over my article on PTCG Legends. Now by the time you're seeing this video, this article is just about a month old. So I figured now that we gave it some time to simmer on the website, I'd like to actually make some YouTube content out of it too. Just get a free video out of something I've already worked on. How about that? So essentially this article is going over the problems of the 2000 World format. And as I'm going to read ahead... Uh, it is my favorite format of all time. I'm just mainly talking about issues that other people have, issues that I have, things like that. Um, so yeah, let's get right into it. Essentially, I'm just going to be going over this article. If you want to read it as well, it's in the description of this video. You can go read it for yourself if you want, just want to go have a primer. Otherwise, I'm going to go over the whole thing and talk about like what I mean in more detail. So this first one talks about here how... Um, it is one of the best formats of all time. The deck diversity, addictive gameplay, um, just really, really good format. It's obvious why people come back. People don't come back to bad formats as much. It's why 2010 is like easily these days the most popular format, at least in the West, um, for retro. If you um, like, other than like GLC, probably the most popular alt format as well. Um, but. Despite that, the format has a lot of attractors, a um, lot of people that don't like things about the format, and that's why I got um, interested to write this article. It's, um, you know, a lot of people don't like 2010 despite it being so good, um, so why don't they like it? And, you know, let's analyze that and kind of look on the flip side, play devil's advocate a bit for my opinions. Um, it also links to my uh, Worlds for Dummies, nice two-hour video if you want to watch that. If you haven't, I explain a lot about the 2010 Worlds format. And yeah, that let's get right into it. Uh, shout out to Alex, I will say, um, Alex Wilson from PTCG Legends. He runs the website, he lets me post the articles here, and he does all of these pretty little images we're going to see along the way. I wrote everything here, but he added some images for some flair and very nice hard gold silver play mat at that with the nice dialgachon picture um so the first thing i talk about is the deck building limitations um 2010 is a format with a lot of deck building limitations gardevoir galade and lux chomp are really good decks and they provide these limitations um I say, in many formats, players decide between making more consistent lists and less tech cards versus lists that are more teched out at the cost of some consistency. The modern iterations of 2010 Worlds lists, however, force players to respect the best decks in their construction. It may not seem obvious on the surface, so let's break it down. Um, the first thing I go through is supporter lines. The list at the time of the 2010 World Championships hadn't yet adapted to Gardevoir because Gardevoir, it wasn't an unknown factor. There was the Canadian Gardevoir and several good players like Pramawat, um, like Jay Hornung had been getting ready to play Gardevoir into the event, um, but it wasn't like known to be the best deck. And that's seen in the supporter lines. Now we've definitely seen a change. If you don't know, Telepass is a pokey power that... Can we click this? There we go. This is not a very good skin. It allows you to uh, look at your opponent's discard pile, grab a supporter card there, and uh, use the effect of it as the effect of that pokey power, and it doesn't use your supporter for turn. So essentially you get two supporters every turn, and this can be used to take advantage of tech supporters. That's why you see a lot of lists that are updated these days, like outside of SP lists, most lists are running three supporters maximum. And you gotta be very careful when playing things like Judge against Cardivore. Um, the, the way this is most often seen is by playing a smaller number of unique supporter cards in decks. Despite the existence of Verse Seeker, a card that you know helps reuse supporters, usually makes it so supporters are more techy. Um, despite the existence of Versa Seeker in the format, decks are running very little variety in supporter cards as to not give Gardevoir a leg up in games. You know, obviously you're going to have to play some supporter cards, but the difference between giving Gardevoir something like a Lucian or a Palmer or a Bucks Training is very different from just giving them another search card that they already have access to. 
Um, a popular supporter tech in 2009, Lucian's assignment allows them to move energy around their field, is a rare sight in 2010. If your deck already has a terrible Guard of War matchup, such as King or Prime, you may choose to run cards like Palmer's Contribution anyway. This is Palmer's recovery card as you weren't likely to win against a setup Guard of War deck to begin with. Most other decks, though, will keep Telepass in mind. And this is definitely a true thing. Even though Guard of War is the best deck in the format, um, and all decks should technically take it, uh, keep it in mind, like, there's just... You're not beating the Guard of War uh, with a Kingdra Prime deck if they set up. This isn't a flaw of the format in itself. Every format's going to have decks with bad matchups to certain other decks, and... In this case, uh, Kingdra is not going to beat a setup Gardevoir deck because it just can't output enough damage, and it's unable to use its power, which is super reliant on it. Um, so yeah, this like, you know, if your deck's gonna lose anyway, you might as well put it in because maybe it can be useful in another matchup. The exception to this rule is SP-focused decks, as I said earlier, as running multiple different supporter cards works perfectly in tandem with Cyrus Conspiracy, which allows you to search supporters. The toolbox supporters of SP also helps them address it different situations as they come, which is a specialty. You do still have to be very careful when playing SP about what cards you play. Let's just say you're playing at Utica Masada's World's Winning List, as an example, just because it's a well-known list. Um, you'll want to be very careful playing your Professor Oak's new theory because you don't want to give your opponent access, the Gardevoir access to use that every turn. Again, Judge is a really big one. Um, we'll get onto that. In addition to the limitation on what supporters can see play when you play your supporters, um, is when you can play your supporters. Playing an early Judge to get an advantage may seem optimal until the Gardevoir has access to using that Judge against you via Telepass for the rest of the game. So, essentially... You just have to be very careful with how you play your supporters around Gardevoir. You usually play, you know, these lines of, like, just Roseanne, you know, Bebe, and, like, Judge, or Professor Oak's New Theory, you know, Felicity's in your deck. Um, usually you just play three of those. Unless you're playing SP. Second card I have listed as a uh, deck-building limitation is Spirit Tomb. It's a powerful card seen in nearly every single evolution deck to some extent, besides Gyarados. Um, its Keystone Seal Pokebody slows down faster decks like SP, Gyarados, and Jumpluff, giving slower evolution decks time and help in setting up. It also blocks Power Spray, disruptive cards in all SP decks. Um, this is really big. This is why Spirit Tomb is partially so good. Like, yes, Train Lock is really good, Dark Trace is really good, but blocking Power Spray is one of the best things about it because it means you guaranteed get Clay Dolls off to draw more cards in the early game. So you can get a setup very consistently. Although the item lock is also just big in general, because you can, uh, you know, you can slow your opponent down and get your guy set up without them being sniped on the bench as easy. Um, Spirit Tomb's Darkness Great searches out an evolution deck's necessary Claydol and their attackers. The deck building against and around Spirit Tomb is seen in nearly every deck. The Keystone Seal Pokebody has to be respected if you want to be able to play on an even playing field against Curscore, Gardevoir, and Flygon. Otherwise, powerful cards are not played in most decks, and otherwise, optional cards are seen frequently. So, how does this apply? Um, in 2009, we saw Pokedrawer Plus. If you play one, you draw a card. If you play two, you search your deck for up to two cards, um, and you have to play them at the same time. Um, this was a really popular card in 2009, but really doesn't see any play in 2010. I don't, I don't even think I talked about it in my Worlds for Dummies video. Um, it's a powerful trainer card in Claydol decks, especially because you can use Claydol to help find those pieces to search any two cards out of the deck. We saw it in David Cohen's Stalgon deck to play second at the 2009 World Championships and Seniors, among other decks like Speed Machamp at the time. Um, with the near guarantee of a Spirit Tomb in the active spot in the first or second turn, a lot of the item consistency has to be reconsidered in decks. Pokedex Handy 910 is similarly absent from lists. This one, look at the top two cards of your deck, choose one and put it into your hand, put the other to the bottom. It's a shame because I actually really like this card. Um, I think it's just a very good vanilla um, cons consistency boost to your deck. Um, and does he play in 09? Um, I think there was the Mother Guard that was playing it at Worlds that year. Uh, Jason Martinez, I believe, won juniors with it. The new Trainer vs. Seeker, which we mentioned previously, also sees Sparing Use Index, both through the supporter limitations and the presence of Spirit Tomb. In the space created by cards taken out of decks, we see new innovation to take on Spirit Tomb. Rose Ray GL is an example in SP decks. If you don't know Rose Ray GL, um, I'll have a graphic on screen while I'm doing this, uh, uses Poison Bind, uh, which poisons Spirit Tomb and prevents it from retreating, so you stop your opponent from attacking 
for a while and you keep the spear tomb poisoned which can potentially knock it out going back into your turn um, as i say right here it's poison bind wears spear tombs down fast stops them retreating and can potentially knock them out going into the sp player's turn which if that happens and they don't have a replacement spear tomb you get access to trainers again which is really big um, Reg Ace is a card already played in Gyarados Wrench and Gigas decks for its Regimove Poke Power, which switches the opponent's benched or active basic. It pushes it to the bench and they get to choose a new active. Um, it sees increased usage now um, because it's a check to Spear Tomb. Just be careful not to let it get trapped in the active spot while Spear Tomb is there if you start Reg Ice, which is really bad. Some Brave players have even slotted Special Darkness Energy into their Gyarados as, as an additional way to beat Spear Tomb as an already mandatory Sableye. We'll get into this card later um can use overconfident to cleave through spear tomb as an evolution deck your best response spear tomb may be putting up a spear tomb over your own setting up behind it and forcing the opponent to make the first move um this is something i really like it's similar to the um wars of attrition that you get with cards like um scramble energy in 2008 and 2006 you know those formats um but it, i feel like it's a little bit like less like just a little bit less explosive in the, in one way and also just like one of the things that i appreciate about 2010 is there's comeback mechanics but they're not explicitly stated on cards and this is kind of a similar thing um like it's like forcing the opponent to stick his, the uh, first spirit tomb you know setting your board up in that way isn't in, in a way you know if they attack first you can come back but it's not just like oh if you're behind on prizes this does this it's there's like comeback built into the way the game is played and the game is designed instead of just literal comeback mechanic cards all right continuing on probably the most obvious impact on the meta brought by spear tomb is dialga chomps rise to stardom dialga g level x time crystal turns off spear tombs pokey body uh keystone seal dialga can also shrug off psychic attacks from gardevoir and gengar which uses spear tomb and also troubles fly on decks that rele heavily rely on its pokey body Turning off Spear Tomb means that Dialga decks will once again get access to their powerful trainer cards, and uh, Dialga Chomp in itself has also caused a chain reaction of deck building presence in the meta, such as like Blaziken, but we'd be here all day. Essentially, you know, Spear Tomb not only has caused limitations in decks, changes in lists, but also caused Dialga Chomp to become a much better deck from its uh, Spear Tomb's presence in the meta, um, and it matching up well into those decks. Decks running Spear Tomb also have to be able to uh, also have to consider on their side how to build their decks. Warp Energy has become a staple choice to escape attacks like Rose Ray Jail's Poison Bind and Infinite Traps created by Sp Spear Tomb's Colorless Resistance um, into Chat Hot and Flygon. These guys will just trap you forever, so don't fall into that. Um, lastly, there is or next there is the uh, Power and Trainer Lock Conundrum. Um, lastly, the never-ending question of what to tech your deck for. In the 2010 season, Luxray GL Level X and Crobat G, this is Gust, this is Damage Buff, saw near ubiquitous use in Gyarados and Jump Bluff decks to Gust and increase the damage of your attacks, but in 2023 a bit of a problem forms. The prevalence of Power Lock from Power Spray in SP decks and Psychic Lock in Gardevoir decks has pointed some players towards using trainer-based gusting and modifiers in Blower Plus, Reversal, and Plus Power. These are gusting effects that says play two when you get to gust. This is flip a coin you get to gust, Pokemon Catcher, and this is plus power, just do 10 more damage. With Gardevoir and SP being great decks, you can rely on these trainer cards to answer those matchups. The conundrum comes from our friend Spirit Tomb. Decks that rely on trainer based gusts and damage minor fighters will no longer be able to aptly answer Curse Car and Magnezone decks that hide behind Spear Tomb's Keystone Seal. So essentially, you gotta do a bit of a trade off. Do you use Luxray and Crobat, but you you better be uh, you do better against Curscar and Magnezone, Magnezone being a bit of a rogue, or do you use the trainer based and do better against Gardevoir and SP decks? Um, I will say Gardevoir and SP do make up quite a lot more of the metagame. Um, these days, you know, you're usually going to run into about into a tournament probably like 40% SP, honestly, because between Dialga Chomp, uh, Shen Block, and Lux Chomp, you know, things like that, you're going to run into a lot of SP decks, and Gardevoir is also usually going to show up as well because it's considered the best deck, so. You know, I think the trainer lock wins out in my eyes just because blower. I just really love Poke Blower. It also has additional utility as a potential damage modifier, right? 
Um, so there's just some extra utility there, but like there's nothing stronger than the power of Gust brought by Luxray and Crobat. So I definitely understand why people, um, you know, use those back then. And, you know, even now, if you want to beat Kurskar, these are like your best options. So is attack-based gusting the answer? Well, no. Unknown G can stop a attack-based gusts, and you can't attack with a gust attack and then also attack um, with, you know, like Tail Revenge. Um, maybe supporter cards like Buck's Training can supplement as damage modifier, which is a supporter. It does 10 more damage. But do you really want to give Guard of War decks the ability to telepass your Buck's Training for the rest of the game? Absolutely not. Um, for players newer to the format, these limitations make your head spin, but for people who've played a few games, you've probably found your preference. As I said, I like the Trainer Gust or prepared to make a meta call into an event based on which decks will and will not show up. For as many options that have been opened up by exploring the wealth of cards available, just as many options are shut down as lists are optimized to deal with meta behemoths. And this is true. So really just whatever your choice is, there's no wrong choice. We're all playing for fun anyway. Um, I just prefer the trainer system just because Gardevoir and SP are generally going to be higher um, combined by far than just Curse Guard and Magnazone. Magnazone rarely shows up. Uh, so it, it's really what you're after. Um, so next section we have is lock decks. Some of the most polarizing decks in the format are based around a locking mechanic. Unlike lock decks from years following and years prior, the lock decks in Tilson 9 and 10 do not have reliable energy denial in energy removal 2 and crushing hammer. 2010 has a wealth of lock decks though, most popularly seen in Trainer Lock from Kurskar and Poke Power Lock from Gardevoir, but instead I want to focus on the more hardcore lock decks in this section. Um, so first I mentioned Sable Lock and Shen Lock. These decks are my least favorite decks in the format. Um, these two lock decks focus around the use of Sableye combined with an SP engine. Sable Lock was used by a list by Conley to win US Nationals and Top 16 in the World Championships with Sableye and other dark type disruption. Um, and Garchomp C level X, the SP package is there as well. Um, Shenlock is the more scary one, there's not a list here, but essentially it plays Blaziken FB level X as an additional disruptive and attacking power. And Blaziken's really big because you can drag up Pokemon from the bench, um, moving the Spirit Tomb out of the active um, if you can't deal with it, or moving whatever your opponent has, bringing up a Claydol is really strong. You force a lot more out of them that way, and it's just a really strong nuke. Um, both the decks rely on Impersonate to use Cyrus' initiative to disrupt the opponent's hand. Essentially, turn one, going first, they're going to strip your hand of cards. And they're usually going to flip two heads because that's what the supporter does. So they're going to get two cards of their choice out of your hand before you've even taken a turn. With Chat Hot G, which rearranges the top four cards of your opponent's deck, I'm not sure how they printed this and thought it was fine. This card's would definitely be banned today. Um, to prevent drawing out of the lock and Blaziken FB or Garchomp C level X to neutralize Claydol, these decks quickly create an inescapable lock. Sableye also specializes in tearing apart decks reliant on Spear Tomb with its overconfident attack when boosted by a special darkness energy. Essentially how this works, overconfident, you can kind of read this here, if the defending Pokemon has fewer remaining HP than Sableye, this base damage is 40. With special darkness that becomes 50 and you already KO Ghastly with that, but also Spirit Tomb, when it has damaged itself because Darkness Grace damages itself to evolve a Pokemon, uh, then Overconfident will take a knockout. And usually when you're against, when you're playing like a Spirit Tomb deck like Kurskar that is purely reliant on Spirit Tombs for its setup, um, your opponent's just going to take three to four prize cards with a single Sableye, with a single energy, turn after turn. It is going to quite literally be like a five turn game and you're probably going to lose that many prizes, not get any powers off um, consistently, and not have any setup on your board at all. Um, and you'll have the top cards of your deck rearranged as well. Um, playing against these decks is essentially they either lock you if you're playing a Spear Tomb deck, or it's like an even game if you're playing a not Spear Tomb deck and you're able to get out of the lock, they start to be a lot weaker. Um, Sable, um, I, I covered that. Power Spray also ensures you can never get out of a lock with an emergency use of Uxie's setup. Now, obviously, if you're behind a Spear Tomb, you can set up, but throwing Spear Tombs at Sableye is a bad idea. Um, I've definitely been thinking about some innovation um, in Curse Card to potentially deal with these, because these are popular decks. They're a very good tournament choice. Um, you usually see one or two people bringing them to, um, like, online webcam tourneys because you're just going to auto win Kurskar, frankly. Um, as Kurskar lists are built now, they are not built at all to deal with this. Um, but I'm working on some cooking. Maybe we'll get something to help curb the problem soon. 
Uh, and this is Conlay's top 16 worlds list. Uh, Glide score, I just did a little section on this. The less successful lock deck will try to keep the opponent paralyzed the whole game. Use Glide score, shoot poison to paralyze and poison the opponent, and then uh, the other Glide score is an attack that picks it up out of play. Um, and you BTS, put it back down the next turn. And you move into Spirit Tomb, prevent the opponents from using trainer cards, and you paralyze them so they can't switch or warp point. Um, this deck is less successful due to the prevalence of warp energy and pokey power denial. So things like Gardevoir, once they Psychic Lock, you can't use your thing anymore. They also have that teleportation pokey power to just move them in and out of the active spot. So it's, you can't, you have to like paralyze that Gardevoir level X in the active. Um, warp energy, you know, things like Curse Guard play like warp energy. Um, Gyarados plays four warp energy, you're doomed there. Um, anyway. Then we go into Flygon decks. Well, it wasn't utilized in Dave and Sturm's top 32 worlds list. Most Flygon lists nowadays take advantage of Memory Berry, which allows you to copy the attack of mainly Trap Inch here. Trap Inch has uh, a Lysander attack and an attack that stops your opponent retreating. Um, and the Sand Tomb attack is really big. Uh, here's an image of Trap Inch again, because you stop your opponent retreating. And because Flygon has colorless typing and Spirit Tomb has a colorless resistance, essentially... Memory Berry on your Flygon, copy Sand Tomb, you uh, are milling the opponent with Wind Erosion, and they are stuck forever without... Warp Energy is the only way out, because they can't play Warp Point, because it's a trainer card, and Spirit Tomb turns that off. Um, so you do Santa Trap Tapping on Trap Inch while using Flygon's Wind Erosion Pokebite to delete the opponent's deck, while their support Pokemon are haplessly trapped. While well, Sand Tomb would eventually knock out an opponent from damaging them enough, a Spirit Tomb with its colorless resistance will take no damage from Flygon copying Sand Tomb, creating a in, near instant loss, basically, if the Spirit Tomb player doesn't have a way to escape the active spot. Spirit Tomb can technically kill itself, um, but that's going to be like 12 cards milled from your deck at that point, <laughs> um, which is kind of crazy. And, like, if they see you're going to kill yourself on that turn, they're not going to trap you on that last turn. They're going to leave you in play and then, like, hit something on your bench or Forest Murmurs up something else to trap it. Um, well, just don't let Spirit Tomb come into the active spot is an argument that would work if not for the use of Torterra level X's Forest Murmur. So yeah, they get any target they want, they bring it up, and you trap it. Um, this list obviously doesn't play the Memory Berry, but most lists stays pretty much unanimously do. Any Flygon deck pretty much has to play it because it's such a good option to just, you know, get some auto wins. Um, what each of the decks have, have in common is a lack of player agency from the other player. I can't affect the coin flip results of Osiris' initiative, nor can I prepare my hand to be hit from Osiris' initiative before I've even taken my first turn. Reminder that Sableye forces that player to go first, so they always get to go first if they start it. I, if I don't play ways to escape the Paralysis lock and I start Spear Tomb as my active Pokemon, I probably just lose to Gliscor and Flygon. Um, similar complaints are raised against more recent standard format deck, Snorlax Block Stall. You've ever had a game where you started Greninja, don't have any way to get out of play, and then it's just like, well, I lose, right? Same thing, um, where some fact ga some games are lost as soon as they begin if your deck isn't adequately built to deal with it in multiple ways. In summary, losing games to factors outside of your control is not fun. Um, and you know, Flygon still gets some really good games in there. If you're playing Flygon against an SP deck or against Gardevoir, um, it's much more difficult to trap those decks. Um, so you're still going to get good games uh, with those, but... A lot of times it could just be, it, it, it's a noob stomper deck. A lot of people are going to, like, I hate using that word because it sounds derogatory, but I'm not joking when I say that this deck will end so many games of so many new players who aren't prepared to deal with it. Next up we go to Double Colorless Energy. Double Colorless Energy is possibly the single most controversial card in the 2010 Worlds format. Again, shout out to Alex for the visuals. This is very pretty. This strong special energy returned after a decades-long hiatus from the game to wreak havoc on the 2010 world format. It's used to power up many of the best attacks in the format, like Dragon Rush on Garchomp and Gardevoir's Psychic Clock. Many argue that the card creates an unhealthy presence in the meta from the decks that take advantage of it. Dragon Rush being able to power it up is quite a formidable threat. Psychic Clock being effortlessly powered up, allowing for use of multiple Gardevoir attacks, is also quite scary. If you don't know, the Gardevoir deck wants to power up in an ideal scenario like two to three Gardevoirs and just swap between them while healing off damage. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, I want to make an argument on why DCE is good for the meta. Specifically, I believe that the 2010 Worlds format without double colorless energy would be a metagame highly centralized around Curse Gar and Gyarados. Even with the existence of DC, these are two of the strongest decks in the format. 
but without DC, their counters have a much harder time answering these decks. Um, also, Jump Pluff could be added there, but Jump Pluff just doesn't do well against Karskar. Um, but it you know, can beat Gyarados pretty consistently, 50-50 or so. In addition, DC enables several more decks than it shuts down. Um, DC enables Garchomp from Supreme Victors. Regigigas, he put the wrong Garchomp. I, I should contact him about that. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, Regigigas, level X. Obama Snow. Um, this card is like unplayable without DC. Regigigas level X, it doesn't look like it used DC, but it's uh, base form has some attacks you can use with DC. Um, just get some damage in. in. Um, Flygon, I don't think Flygon is very much worth playing in this format without DC, just because it's so easily checked. And even without DC, SP would be playing Garchomp, and it's so easily checked by Garchomp that I don't think it's worth playing without DC, frankly. Um, and it can't use Upper, because it's, you know, so reliant on level X. Uh, Steelix Prime, another deck. I feel like this one would probably still survive, just because it self-accelerates, but it'd be a lot worse. Um, um, Hippowdon, this deck is... Very good because of DC. Not very good. It's a rogue deck, but, you know, it's fun. DC really thrives in it. Uh, Tangrowth, this, you can't see it here, but it's Reliant. And Tyranitar, which uh, absolutely needs DC for these expensive attacks. Let's see. Um, previously mentioned, SP decks would struggle to maintain relevance. The SP decks that barely maintain their wins versus Kurskar and Gyarados would now lose to it. Um, it's very hard to play against Gyarados, with an SP deck, if they have AMU in play and you don't have DC, like, that's just not fair. <laughs> You're not winning that. Um, Dalgachomp would survive, but would no doubt be damaged and lost of its second favorite special energy, and Gardevoir would fall off, as Kurskar is far too apt of an answer for it, and Gyarados is too fast for it to deal with. Um, if you ever think Gardevoir is just unbelievably broken, BDIF, doesn't matter which Gardevoir variant, just play Gyarados again, to, and Gyarados is, like, 70-30 in Gardevoir. Um, I promise, it's really strong. Um, and Gyarados is too fast to deal with when your attacker that took three whole turns to power up is knocked out in a single attack. Um, yeah, I'll have to contact Alex about that wrong Garchomp. Whoops. There's no denying the power of DCE and its effect on the format. Some players were targeted as the root of their problems with the format, which I believe to be an inaccurate assumption. Um, yeah, some players were targeted as the root of their problems with the format, though, which I believe to be an inaccurate assumption. The best counters to DCE in the 2010 Worlds format are playing a good deck that can deal with decks utilizing DCE. Um, and I say, I promise you, it's not as difficult as you may think. Um, if you've seen any of my videos that go around with DC, like, DC is so integral to, like, so many decks. Um, and I think it not being around, like, DPAR, I think a lot of, like, a lot of the DPAR, I'm not a DPAR expert. I'm going to clarify this. I've played, like, maybe, what, at this point, two games of the format. Um, but I'm speaking from someone who's played, you know, hundreds of 2010 games that without DCE, it is very centralized. I think a lot of people get a false idea of these decks that are like could be viable in DPAR, but I think a lot of them are just bad um, without DCE. Um, it, like Jason's blog talks about Amphi Snow, and I just think it's un completely unplayable without DCE. Um, you know, things like they're like, oh yeah, Gardevoir is still playable. I don't think so. Probably not. Definitely not. Um, yeah, like, it, DCE just makes the format so much wider. It doesn't, it's not that it limits DAX playability, it's that it increases it significantly. Um, so, deck choice limitation. Uh, the 2010 Worlds format has a, large, uh, has a large variety of playable archetypes. For example, there was 14 different archetypes present in top 32. Even among archetypes, a large variant shows can be observed with a different number of Lux Chomp and different tech lines put into the Gardevoir decks present in top 32. Um, like, I believe in top 32, there was three Gardevoir decks with one, or three variants, with one being the Canadian one playing Poke Healer. Um, there was Gardevoir with Nidoqueen, um, that made top eight, I believe, and then Gardevoir that made finals, the Pramowat Guardi with Machamp and, um, Dusnor. And obviously, nowadays, Gardevoir is like GGAMU, or you're playing Gardevoir with Dusnor and Nidoqueen, so those are the, what are found to be the two best stage twos. Um, and then Lux Chomp, you know, there was... A Lux Chomp Infernape, there was Lux Chomp with Entei Raikou Legend, Lux Chomp with Dialga, plenty of regular Lux Chomps, there was Dialga Chomp, you know, plenty of different decks in the top 16. Um, 
Despite this, there are limitations in what decks you can succeed with in a modern context of the format. Certain decks fell off if changes to the metas occur, this happens with all formats, and as with any format, some strategies simply cannot compete with the top decks. Um, spread, so spread takes a back seat in the 2010 Worlds format. Um, it's not for lack of capable attackers, both of these are pretty good. You know, spread 20 to everything but water and grass, that's actually a really weird uh, condition, <laughs> which feels really bad because it just auto loses jump bluff. Um, and then spread 30 to everything. Both come equipped with solid attacks. Um, spread is limited due to the popularity of SP decks, which have Garchomp, Healing Breath, heal all damage from all your SP Pokemon when you level it up, and Needle Queen, which heals one damage counter in between turns from all your Pokemon. So, you know, you just take damage off board. Both of which enter spread flawlessly. Um, Garchomp's little X comes with the Healing Breath. Um, that uh, prevents it from uh, staying on board. Obama Snow answers Garchomp by playing Ampharos, which turns off uh, all Poke powers of Pokemon with damage on them, so Garchomp can't use it. Um, but Tyranitar in the matchup is just going to instead use its grind attack, which does plenty of damage to knock out Garchomps. Um, Needle Queen is the real nail in the coffin, though, for spread, as Obama Snow can't reliably answer it, and as it passively removes all the damage on the opponent's board and reactivates the Poke powers that Ampharos shut off. Um, so yeah, Needle Queen's really a thing. Um, I did actually see an interesting Obama Snow with Dusnor deck that I faced um, at Locals not too long ago, like a week ago at this point. Um, that was really interesting. It's a way to beat the matchup. It really only works in closed deck lists. It's kind of like a surprise factor, and then your opponent's never playing into it again. But I guess, you know, that can work in a closed deck list uh, tournament. So, you know, maybe Obama Snow isn't as dead as I thought. Um, your chances of playing a Garchomp C or Needle Queen in a tournament is pretty much near certain. Garchomp's in every SP deck. Needle Queen is in Curse Guard, Gardevoir, and Flygon. So, yeah, you're pretty much always hitting those. And spread, so spread strategies to take a back seat. Sorry, I'm not good at enunciating words. As with any format, a large number of rogue strategies exist that are tailor-made to answer specific meta decks. Problem with the 2010 Worlds format is some of these meta decks are much more difficult to deal with than others. Um, now, this is something interesting. People, are, people really uh, don't agree with this. I promise you, I play a really good Luxon player all of the time, and I consistently win with most rogue decks because they're basically designed to take on Luxchomp. Uh, despite popular belief, Luxchomp is, in my opinion, the easiest meta deck to counter with a rogue deck, depending on its variant. A large swath of rogue decks have arisen purely from their ability to take on uh, Luxchomp. Let's take, for example, the Obama Snow Ampharos deck, as well as Tangrowth and Hippowdon. Um, now, Tangrowth can actually take on Gyarados and um, Kingdra. There's some other things that it can take on. Um, so uh, I, I'm selling Tangrowth a little short there because it's got a very valuable water resistance and built-in healing. Pretty much everything but Gardevoir and Fire types can be taken on. In the 2010 season, speed decks like Kingdra Prime and Donphan Prime fulfilled a similar role. These decks also basically only take on SP and lose to everything else. Um, these decks survive off preying on Luxchomp, as their matchups into other meta decks are shaky at best. Even some Luxchomps, though, carrying Blaziken or, or uh, Blaziken FB level X or Entei Raikou, essentially fire types, aptly answer these decks and erase their only advantage into the meta game. The popularity of regular Luxchomp, casual enjoyment of the format, and the occasional good matchup into another deck keeps these rogue decks alive despite their weaknesses. In this format, what separates a Tier 2 deck from a Rogue deck in my eyes is the ability to answer more than just Luxchomp. A Tier deck, 2 deck, like Garchomp SV, depending on how it's built, can beat Luxchomp, but can also play well into Gardevoir and has a great matchup against Gyarados. A Rogue deck like a Powdown can deal with Luxchomp and steal games against a lucky matchup like Regigigas, but loses to Gyarados, Gardevoir, Kurskar, and Jumpluff, which, you know, that's why it's Rogue. With some very dominant top decks in the format, where does innovation come from then? mainly the refining of, uh, refining of pre-established archetypes and exploration of partners for already good cards. One such example is the creation of the GG AMU deck, which is Gardevoir Gallade with the AMU package, which is a Gardevoir list that aptly answers decks that began to pop up to cancel uh, or to counter the standard Gardevoir list. Um, Steelix Prime, really big guy, takes less damage from Psychic, forces your opponent to use Gallade to knock it out, but they can only do that one time, and essentially as long as you get the second Steelix in play, and set up the Gardevoir player loses. So GGAMU does deal with Steelix because Masperate Level X, which you'll see on screen right now, just Oko's Steelix uh, cleanly. Um, even with like maximum debuffs, it's I think it still takes knockout with Expert Belt. So 
yeah, Steelix doesn't like that. Um, but honestly, one thing a lot of people get wrong about GG AMU is that it counters Fly, uh, Fly Terra. It doesn't. Fly God eats AMU decks alive uh, because it mills them, which really hurts with all your one ofs, and then it's extreme attacking. Uh, and you can't, you literally, it's impossible to set up AMU on a board uh, having anything else but them in play. You need all six slots developed to those then. Um, it's impossible to set it up otherwise with extreme attack because you just knock out whichever level X they can't replace um, immediately and it's impossible to set it up. And like I said, you're milling important one ofs the whole time. Flygon is, you know, really good time into GGMU. Um... So let's see, um, yeah, there we go. Another such example is the deck I've been working on, Metagon. I did cover this on the channel. Check out that video if you haven't already. I did a in-depth deck profile on Metagon. Um, pretty exciting creation. Um, this deck utilizes Flygon and the trapping strategy that I covered previously to pair with Metagross, which gusts up Pokemon with Magnetic Reversal. Metagross also provides a solid attacker in non-SP matchups. With Honchkrow added to put Spear Tombs into play repeatedly, as long as Honchkrow is your active Pokemon and your opponent's bench is in full, search your opponent's discard file before a basic Pokemon and put it onto his or her bench. So, we trap Spear Tomb, or we put one in play and then we bring it up and trap it. <laughs> this deck is designed to take on decks reliant on Spear Tomb, while also being able to aptly answer other decks with a unique blend of offense and disruption. And there's the video link. Alrighty, so, the SP engine creates one of the most unique and fun playstyles we've seen in the Pokemon TCG. Um, this section is, is SP broken. Um, using a combination of disruption and unmatched versatility to have an answer to nearly every deck in the format. Um, basically every deck in the format. In short, is SP broken? Yes. SP has exclusive access to some of the best trainer cards ever printed. Its attackers don't let up either. Garchomp to Lolex was undoubtedly the best attacker of its time. Decks like Jumpluff, Donphan Prime, and Kingdra Prime joined Luxchomp in a coalition of speed decks that excelled at taking six prize cards as fast as possible, or taking more than the opponent when the round time was called. Now, is SP broken in the context of the modern 2010 meta? Not as much. The format has plenty of ways to answer SP built into lists. Spirit Tomb we talked about, huge SP check, Judge keeping hand sizes low, and um, so they can't use their versatility, and Pokepower lock stops them from healing, gusting, and drawing cards. Well, the AMU engine that I previously mentioned is slowed down SP attacks. And just another example, Machamp is an SP counter. It's not great as an SP counter because they can just prevent... Uh, take out from taking them out with an unknown G attach that prevent the effect of attack But it is like a nice surprise option and then the as elf is really strong uh, If you have UC and Mesper to play the attacks of each of your opponent's basic Pokemon cost colorless more so um, Just making their attacks inefficient is really strong um, Like I said SP without double close energy is just is bare basically unable to answer as elf um, There are plenty of cards uh, from this time that in a vacuum seem broken. Broken time space allows you to evolve your Pokemon as often as you like. Uh, in particular, boggles the mind of the modern players, imagining all they could get up with it. In the context of this format though, especially the modern metagame that has evolved to deal with its many components, SP fits right in. Don't let this fool you though, SP is still a strong presence with its many forms and adaptations and it must be respected. Um, so in accessibility, um, this is the, I believe, last section here. Um, with early Diamond and Pearl cards nearing their 17th birthday in 2024, the cost of these old cards have slowly creeped up over time. The pandemic causing a staggering rise in the price of retro staples such as Mesprit, which cost $15 in 2020. Um, Mesprit in particular has recovered, but most of the general staples of this format now cost far more than what I paid for them two years ago. Double Colors Energy, Uxi, Ball Toy, and Roseanne's Research have doubled in price, while Judge's Resurgence of Standard has caused it to quintuple in price. The cards commonly seen in SP decks have never been cheap to begin with, and while the Celebrations Classic Collection has made the level X staples of those decks accessible, the SP trainers and basic Pokemon, most notably the Toxicroak promo, which is $20, um, cost more now than ever since their initial rotation. There's no way around the cost of the format, and while it doesn't cost as much as the EX series formats, investment in 2010 is going to uh, take some serious financial commitment if you're not willing to print proxy your decks. Um, again, <laughs> I will say it's not as expensive as the 20, uh, 2006 and RSPK formats in 2007. Those are like $1,000 deck formats for a lot of the decks. Uh, oh, you can play this uh, Lunar Rock deck. Yes, that's one rogue deck that you can play um, that doesn't cost that much money. Uh, here, here's your $200 um, meta deck from 2010, right, in comparison. 
Lastly, the complexity of this format. Throughout the entire article thus far, I've used the word lock quite a lot. And while not every deck in the 2010 Worlds format plays into a hard lock, almost every deck in the format is playing some sort of disruption to throw their opponent off. It, there's no such thing in 2010 as, uh, as like just a deck that doesn't disrupt the opponent, right? Um, the commonly played Dust Norm, which limits opponents to three benched Pokemon, lest they fall victim to Dark Palm. Pokey Power Denial with Gardevoir, SP's Power Spray, and Alakazam. Uh, fun little card. Uh, showing off, turn off your opponent's Poke Powers. Additionally, special additions turn off Poke Powers, so these two SP tools turn them off. Trainer Lock with Spear Tomb, Dialga with Deafen, and also Poke Body Lock. Um, it's, a Dialga puts in Trainer Stadium and Poke Body Lock. Um, and even more honest decks like Gyarados utilize the AMU engine to make it harder for SP to attack and will occasionally employ Garatina's Let Loose to post your opponent to hand disruption. Um, I could name all the different limitations put out by these decks, but I won't. You get the point by now. Almost every 2010 deck is putting out consistent amounts of disruption. This is a daunting reality for new players new to the format. Everyone remembers the first time they lost a game of Dark Palm. With so many layers of red tape on every action you take in the 2010 Worlds format, the complexity is high and forgiveness for mistakes is low. Um, this leads to the format being more inaccessible than the more pick-up-and-play formats we see today. Um... So, essentially, I kind of conclude this by saying that the complexity for me is what makes it enjoyable for me. It's difficult to play around these things at first, but you get very used to it. It rewards skillful play. Um, you know, I want to be upset when my misplay costs me the game ten turns later. I want to not be allowed to use my Poke Powers, Trainers, and Attacks, so that when I create an opportunity to use them, it devastates my opponents. You have to create that opportunity, though. You're not just given it, like, here, go use whatever you want. Um... As I said in the beginning, this is my favorite format. What may look like flaws to other people are things I enjoy, and they allow me to express my skill as a player and make meaningful deck-building decisions. Um, except Sableye. That card, I genuinely think, overconfident should have just been removed from the card. It did not need... Like, just make it do 10 damage. Like, Spear Tomb? Where is he? 10 damage. Balanced card. Well, very good card, but Will-O-Wisp not breaking the game. If this thing had an attack that did, was as good as Sableye, it would be broken. Uh, and Sableye is kind of broken if you played against Shenlong and Sableye, they're not fun. Um, and also this last section here, thanks to Ruby Retro, Jay Hornung, and uh, Nolo for helping me uh, oversee the revision of this article. I did write this, but I um, definitely asked for some opinion. Uh, Jay Hornung, notably, uh, played at the 2010 Worlds Championships with Gardevoir, so it's really great getting his insight on the format, um, being a player at the time. Obviously, things are very different in the information age than they were back then. Um, so anyway, that was my article covering the flaws of the 2010 Worlds format. Before you comment, GGAMU is tier 0 BDIF, play it against a Flygon deck or a Curse Guard, and you'll easily beat the deck. SP also is very even as long as you're a good SP player. Um, so anyway, that's been my article on the 2010 Worlds format, the problems of it. It was interesting playing Devil's Advocate for this article. Again, check it out on PTCG Legends in the description down below. Maybe I'll write an article for there again, thanks to Alex for platforming me and all the lovely folks listed here for helping me with the article. And thank you to the viewer for watching.